all right good morning everyone uh, first of all uh, it is really an honor to be invited uh, for a conference which celebrates the amazing journey of bala as a scientist and as a wonderful person you are so thank you and thank you thank you ajit for having me here so i have been asked to talk about the electromagnetic counterparts of gravitational waves especially low energy <coughs> and this whole field as anupma said uh, rests on exactly one event which happened the same this month exactly 2 years ago and that one event has solved many lingering mysteries in this field but has you know raised many more mysteries are there to be answered while we have not seen any more uh, gravitational wave event with electromagnetic counterpart but i think we are better prepared than before to tackle these things and in this talk i will mainly concentrate on what we learned from this event and how we can prepare ourselves better when the next event will come because this event is not going to be anything like what we saw 2 years ago uh as we all know that you need some material to produce photons uh, which we can see in electromagnetic spectra of of these photons uh, and it is impossibly difficult for black hole mergers to black hole mergers to produce that so i will confine myself to the systems the mergers which include at least one neutron star so that is uh, the aim and kenta has already shown these two slides uh, but you certainly need to have uh, you know a material around the final merger product to be able to produce electromagnetic emission and which depends upon the individual masses the the ratio of the masses the spin of these compact objects and in neutron star black hole case whether the neutron star is gulped directly by the black hole or it does the tidal dance around it before being gulped so all these things will determine what kind of electromagnetic counterparts you will have and that will have implications on the electromagnetic emission what you will see and i will touch upon this uh, the irony of the whole thing is that uh, the lower the mass you have better chances you have to see the electromagnetic counterpart but much more weaker it is the event is in the gravitational wave so difficult it is to look at in the in the gravitational through the gravitational waves window but i will touch base on this in a while um this also much as has been talked about and as i said that we expect very different kind of electromagnetic counterparts but some of the very general uh, general expectations are the following it has been talked about and there are several papers that even during the merger one is supposed to see a radio flare for a very short while of course it's extremely difficult to detect it and no one has seen it but there is a certainly there is a physics behind it and there are papers which exist which tell you that how you are you are likely to see if suppose there is a radio telescope which is looking at everywhere in the sky you will see during the gravitational wave even this kind of thing these mergers are supposed to launch a short gamma ray burst and hence the jet the collimated explosion will happen and of course what kenta told you this uh, there will be this neutron rich material and the radioactive decay of this material will produce the kilonova and of course there will be a long lasting radio merger remnants which we are still waiting in case of gravitational wave 1708 17 event so but in this whole picture of the merger i will concentrate since i am concentrating on the afterglow i will talk about two things one is the jet because it is the jet afterglow which is relevant for me and the kilonova because kilonova is not just producing photons via radioactive decay it is also moving with subrelativistic speeds and it is a very it produces favorable conditions to generate synchrotron radio emission so these are the two things i will talk and uh, jet production is as um, there are a lot of papers on this that how neutron star mergers will produce a short gamma ray burst but there is another interesting thing the ejecta the merger ejecta which is produced in this neutron star merger along the polar axis because of the jet will when it goes through this ejecta it will transfer some of its energy to this merger ejecta and produce something called cocoon 
In this process, jet will lose its energy, but cocoon will gain its energy. And then the radio emission and this cocoon will have subrelativistic energy. So the radio emission, the early radio emission will be interplay between cocoon and jet. And that is, uh, we probably know in case of gravitational wave 17, 08, 17 even, but we yet to understand how this thing happens. And this cocoon ev evidence was also seen in the, in the uh, uh, UVIR observations where we saw two components. The initial component was ultraviolet component which decayed very fast, which probably came from the cocoon. And then the late time infrared was the, the high opacity infrared emission, which one expects in a kilonova. So what I am trying to say is the following. The ejected material in this merger will, produ will produce these things. A short gamma ray burst jet, which may or may not be looking towards you. Uh, a cocoon, which will be much wider in the angle. And so the chances that it is projecting towards you is little higher. And then more isotropic dynamic ejector and the post-merger ejector, uh, uh, which, which will be you know, launched, uh, which will come out during this merger process. And in itself, these are having different mechanisms, but all of these things are moving with ultra-relativistic to sub-relativistic speeds. And by virtue of having the higher speed to lower speeds, Lorentz factor, they will peak in radio band at different times. For example, anything due to the jet will peak at much uh, earlier time because it is much faster. And then you will have the sub-relativistic merger, merger ejecta, which will peak months to years. And as the synchrotron emission property is, it goes, it peaks at lower and lower frequencies at later and later times. When you are seeing anything uh, much later, you will see it in sub gigahertz band. And that has a very big relevance in this talk, so I will touch on this a little bit later. Okay, so why do we want to see radio emission? Of course, radio lasts for a very long time, unlike you know, everything is synchrotron optical. The afterglow is synchrotron, whether it is optical or X-ray or radio, but radio is a low frequency, a low frequency, hence lower energy phenomena, hence it lasts longer. Radio is transient sky is crazy, but optical sky is crazier. So radio is a quieter sky. So it's much easier to look for the transients. And this also becomes relevant in the cases where either the GRB jet was not looking towards us or we missed the kilonova just because maybe it was behind the sun or you know it or it was the neutron star black hole merger where not much kilonova or macronova was produced. And in that case, looking at the transient sky much later, you can still find the evidence of this gravitational wave in radio energies, radio frequencies. So that's why radio emission. So now I will touch base upon because how we can prepare ourselves for the future. I will talk about the parameter space which will be probed by the radio emission. The early radio observations, very important because radio frequencies, emission scintillates. Why? Because there are inhomogeneities in the medium and the length scales of the inhomogeneities mimic the upper limits on the size of the, the phenomena, hence they will produce an upper limit on the size of the, this, this whole uh, the merger process and how the jets are moving, it will produce an up, it will create an upper limit. This will happen with very early radio observations and we have seen in some gamma ray bursts. The VLBI observations, the very large baseline interferometry observations which will have micro arc second resolution, these observations will tell you how the fire, the, the, whole, the, the whole jet is expanding and with what speed is it expanding. And we have seen this in gravitational wave event and we have also seen previously in few events and on some of which some of the Indian astronomers have worked very, uh, you know, much detail. Then there is another thing, the reverse shock emission. The, the synchrotron emission, the forward shock emission will be synchrotron, but there is also a reverse shock which will be created in these jets, which will be in the mass frame will be moving towards the center. And hence, unlike the forward shock synchrotron emission, they will retain the history of the explosion and hence the initial Lorentz factor. This is not possible just by studying the afterglow emission. 
But if you do it in say one to two days, very early radio emission and uh, uh, study, and you see this reverse shock signature, you can constrain the Lorentz factor if you have missed out the, the VLBI because it's far away. The other thing is the early radio observation, because they are absorbed, they will give you density constraints. And sometimes this can be the only way to constrain the environment around these GRBs because the self-absorption frequency is the only frequency which has information about the density. No other frequency has information. It's not dependent upon the density. So it is only the radio observations because it is it goes as lambda squared. Hence, it is better at lower and lower frequencies. In, 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 in this case, in this gravitational wave event, our GMRT observations for the lowest frequency detection of our gravitational waves in the electromagnetic. Unfortunately, even 600 megahertz uh, frequency was not enough to see the synchrotron self-absorption peak, but it still constrained the density to be lower than a certain number, which was possible only for low frequency observations. So that is, uh, okay, I have only four minutes. The late time observations will also probe very important parameter space. One thing is that because it is a synchrotron observation and synchrotron spectral index mimics the particle energy index, which are getting accelerated and producing synchrotron, one gets information about that, which is a very critical information. The late time radio observations, suppose the jet was not looking towards you, suppose you miss the kilonova, you can still, because this jet with time is slowing down and hence literally spreading, at some point it may start to come in your line of sight. And that time you will detect this jet when no other uh, electromagnetic instrument could detect it. And uh, so these are, uh, I think, some of the things. And uh, this I've already said. And off-axis afterglow is very important because what are the chances that this five degree collimated jet is looking towards you? In fact, some simulations have shown that in the gravitational wave O3 run, at most 6% of the gravitational waves should be seen by Fermi or Swift because they will not be looking towards you. But these things one can see at a much later time. Now the second. Uh, and uh, well, this point I will probably pick a little later because right now it's uh, too early. So now what did we learn from gravitational wave 1708, 17 event? There are various models. When we saw the gamma ray burst, of course with a delay of 1.7 seconds, we did not know whether the jet is looking towards you or it is off axis or what is going on. And there were several models, on axis jet, off axis jet, and the, the, the cocoon model where the jet has given rise to some of its uh, energy uh, to the cocoon and that cocoon is creating this, uh, this radio emission and now this is a more favorable condition to detect the radio emission because you're not confined to that five degree uh, jet, collimated jet. And <clears throat> this is the multi-wave emission from gravitational wave 17 over 17 and this is all uh, early observation, but the fact that the radio and x-rays were detected after, after 10 days, it was very clear that we are not dealing, and of course energetics, it was very clear that we are not dealing with the on-axis jet. We are either dealing with the off-axis jet or we are dealing with a cocoon model. Now off-axis jet will not not produce the kind of rise we were seeing in the radio band, which was 0.8. Off-axis jet should rise much faster. So it was very clear early on, we had a paper uh, in 2018 where we, we supported this model in favor of, uh, we, we talked in favor of cocoon model, then the off-axis jet model. But the mystery still stayed, that whether the jet was energetic enough to break through the cocoon and come out of the cocoon or not. And that depends upon the density, the jet energy, and how, how dense, what kind of opacity cocoon is having, what kind of density it is having. And we had no clue whether this model is the final model or this model is the final model. And then we had these observations, we had these observations with several telescopes. Uh, in late time observations, when, after, when there was no other um, emission uh, at higher frequencies, and at that frequencies, we saw that if it was a cocoon dominated much wider, it would have decayed much slower. 
then what we were seeing we were seeing a decay a decay of t to the power minus p the electron energy index and that will happen only in the jet model not only that uh, our vlbi observations were also showing uh, separated by on 75 day and 200 days the observation showed the superluminal motion and they revealed that this there is we are dealing with a jet of 5 degrees and this jet is around 20 degrees off axis from us so that's why initially the gamma ray emission was the breakout of the cocoon but later on the radio emission start to come in our line of sight because jet had uh, lost enough energy and slowed down enough to become literally wider so that was the final thing uh, about what we learned and why do we care about this because this has lot of physics inside it if it is an off axis jet then uh, the, the left side of the thing then we we know that or we can say that maybe every neutron star merger produces a short gamma ray burst so the short gamma ray burst and neutron merger rate should be the same and and if 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 this is true then it constrains the viewing angle and orbital inclination as kenta's paper and kenta also talked in his talk this can constrain the hubble constant but if it's the cocoon it is a better news because we can see it in radio much because it is much wider but it means not every neutron star merger produces a short gamma ray burst and we need to understand that and there is much more variety now in the merger the final outcomes of the merger in terms of electromagnetic counterparts so these are the questions uh, which was very important to learn so now what is next so for whatever i was talking was being played by the jet the jet accelerated cocoon we saw the cocoon we saw the jet coming in our line of sight but what kenta talked of was was the merger ejecta which was producing kilonova but remember kilonova is also moving with sub relativistic speed and at some point we will start to see radio emission from this the synchrotron radio emission from this kilonova component not the kilonova component this merger ejecta and that should show a second peak at much lower frequencies and while there are many telescopes radio telescope which are following this event even now there are only two telescopes which go to this this frequency our indian ugmrt and lofar but lo gmrt is right now is the best telescope in the world with least confusion noise and best place to observe this and with the upgrade you can i am i'm just plotting here a three sigma limit for ugmrt for two hours of observation this is the before ugmrt this gamma ray burst the kind of three sigma limits they had and now we can probe most of these things so this is the kind of science gmrt can do the late time is only possible with ugmrt if it will show a second peak and of course after ugmrt this will be ska because ska mid and ska low will reach enough low energy uh, sub gigahertz frequencies that we can look for these sub merger uh, merger ejecta component and sk will have extremely high resolution which is very important because in this case gravitational wave event the host galaxy ngc 4993 was super bright in radio and so it was very difficult for us to you know Uh, disentangle the emission radio emission from the host galaxy and this but sk will have very good resolution of course sk vlbi it's not vlabi it's vlbi uh, will also give the information but in a much better much more constraining information than gw170817 gave we will be able to it will have much higher sensitivity so we will be able to have the late time prediction and india is a partner of sk, uh, SK uh, international collaboration so we will have the access to the data and i am not saying anything anything about ngvla because even the ngvla will have amazing sensitivity but it is not a sub gigahertz telescope it can only do the earlier jet science jet afterglow science it cannot do merger ejecta science so that's why this is the thing and i think at the end last slide i will just leave you with some of these questions because these questions uh, radio emission is uniquely placed to answer these questions thank you so much